things. One of the things that uh, I appreciate so much whenever I come to this part of our worship is when God gives little tokens to affirm what I'm delivering to you. The song that we just sang, there's no way Joel could have any knowledge of the connection that that hymn has with the message. As I was looking at it, uh, just under it says, we love because he first loved us, 1 John 4.19. And in the message this morning, I'm going to be going to that exact passage, and there's no way Joel could have known, but that's just one of those little things that... Uh, it's just an affirmation that the Lord is aware he's here and he affirms us when we come before him. We're going to be looking today at part of Psalm 112. I have piddled and paddled along with a, a different titles here and there, but it ended up being a phrase in this verse that I wanted to address so we're only going to look at one verse today, but we, God willing, we will continue through the, that chapter. Now let's read verse 1. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. It's that little phrase there about who fears the Lord we're going to spend most of our time on today. But you'll notice he begins, in my translation, they're, they're a lot better than I have any concept of being with, with the uh, original language of Hebrew, but it's all in capitals and it has an exclamation point after it. In other words, David here is in, in great... Uh, strength of spirit and soul to praise God. In fact, it is a zealous declaration. And in, in, in you, you think about this, the, the three words, praise the Lord, can never be said too often. They should ever be on our heart and lips, and our attitude of worship to God for who He is, is blessedness. And the reason is because He is God. He is high and lifted up. His name is above all names. He alone is worthy of praise and worship and adoration. And it will be before him that every knee bows and every tongue confesses. Praising the Lord should always be first in our prayers. And I hope you uh, notice that as we pray, is that we always begin with praise and worship of God. It is foundational in our conduct and ever in our heart. Listen to Ephesians 5, 18 through 20. Paul wrote, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, none of us argue with any of the things that we have here and that our lives are written about and we're encouraged to be constantly in worship. But, and this is something that I have tinkered and piddled and thought about over years worth. And it was when it came up in this particular psalm that I finally said, okay, I'm going to settle this, at least in my mind, in my heart, once and for all. Because I wanted to consider what the motivation is that leads to praise and worship of God. And it's found in Psalm 112, verse 1, the second part. It said, Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. Now, if you'll back up just one chapter to Psalm 111, verse 10, you'll notice a little phrase here that helps us to, that kind of introduces us to verse 1 of our text today, because there <coughs> it is written that the fear of the <coughs> Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We probably 
have quoted that many times through the years. And so what I did and what I want us to do is to look a little closer at the fear of the Lord from the concept of the beginning of wisdom. And you won't have time to turn here. You may want to jot a few of these verses down or maybe watch it uh, uh, maybe tomorrow. But in Proverbs 14, 27, now check this. The fear of the Lord, there's our phrase again. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life that one may turn away from the snares of death. Now, the, the phrase we're looking at, I'm going to give you all a big seminary word here that you're going to say, what does it mean? And then I'll tell you, so don't get, don't get anxious. But the fear of the Lord, that phrase, is part of what is called by theologians the ordo solutions. In other words, the order of salvation. I don't know if you've ever contemplated that, but in what sequence does salvation happen? Because, and what we have to understand is that in the order of salvation, there are things that happen, and they are infinitesimal in time between one another. Uh, now, the thing, the thing that I'm talking about is this order of salvation, that part of the timeline is a conviction of personal sin. That's what we find back there in Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 27. Because that fear is that conviction of sin. That's what we're going to be talking about. It's a part of personal sin. And it is when God reveals a person's sinfulness to them and that they deserve everlasting condemnation because of who they are, a sinner, that the gospel, that the fear of God results in, in other words, down the process, down the, select, down the uh, different paths, that results in a fountain of life. So what we're looking at in Proverbs 14, 27, is that the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life that one may turn away from, that's repentance. That one may turn away from the snares of death, which is the sin that results in damnation. Now, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28, he says, Do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, when the Holy Spirit convicts a person that they are headed for eternal damnation from God in the lake of fire for eternity, there is overwhelming fear. There is a crushing fear of the holiness of a righteous God who, is, who they are on the path for him to destroy their soul and body in hell. And that point right there is the fear of God. When God reveals to a person where they're headed, when they are convicted by the Holy Spirit and they're headed to <coughs> eternal damnation, to hell, then they are given by him the desire to repent. Now I say that because if, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Hold your place in Psalm. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Because I want you to see, I don't want you to just hear me, I want you to see with your own eyes that every part of salvation is initiated by God. So that means that if a person is able to uh, understand who God is and that they uh, realize He is holy and they realize that, that they are a sinner, that they are damned to hell and they need salvation, the only way anybody can ever go through that order in order to be saved is because God initiates it. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Here's what is written by Paul by the inspiration of the Spirit of God. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this, you see that little word, this? Do you know what the word this refers to? Salvation. Everything in it. 
For this is not your own doing. In other words, when it comes to the order of salvation, when it comes to the process of salvation, when it comes to being saved, it is not something that I or you or any human being does. You will look at it here as we're reading it. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this, your salvation, is not your own doing. It, that word it means every part of salvation, is the gift of or from God. You see that? So when it comes to our salvation, and a per, have you ever talked to somebody about the Lord and you're, you're, uh, you see that they just don't get it? And, and if you bring up uh, damnation and you bring up eternity, you know, it just, they just blow it off. That, that's, that, and it doesn't make sense to us because I think we understand the eternal consequence of rejecting Christ. But it doesn't bother them. And you know why? Because God has not yet, doesn't mean he won't, but God has not yet given them what is necessary to believe. Says it, every part of salvation is the gift of God. Now that is what is meant by the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. That little word beginning is really important. Way back there in the Psalm chapter 110. It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning. There is a starting place where every person comes to salvation. And the starting place is the fear of God, a recognition of their sin condition before God and its eternal consequences. And the only way out, the only salvation is Jesus Christ himself. And so that fear of God is the beginning of wisdom means that God initiates the relationship that continues and grows and transforms. That's what God does in the life of us who are believers. Now, turn to 1 John 4. This is where the hymn we sang this morning came in. In 1 John chapter 4, we read a beautiful passage that, we can, that helps us understand the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom, the greatest wisdom in the world, the greatest thing that we can know, the greatest thing we can believe is our own salvation, the death of Christ on the cross, his resurrection, and since sin is imputed to him, he paid our penalty, and therefore we have salvation gifted to us. So here's what we find in 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen, he's talking about the apostles here, and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever, I love that, That's, that means everybody, anybody, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in God, and God abides in him, by this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in the world. I was wanting to get to verse 18 because this is the main part. I wish I could talk to you about everything we just read. Don't have time. But I do want to look at verse 18 and 19. Let, let's catch. Have your pen ready. This is, this is important. There is no fear in love. But perfect love, what? Casts out. And what does it cast out? Fear. Okay, for fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears, and he's talking about God here, talking about eternity, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because what? 
He first loved us. You know what that means? It means if he hadn't loved us, we wouldn't love him. We love him because he first loved us. Now let's go back here to verse uh, 18. The fear of God's eternal wrath and condemnation in hell no longer exists for believers. Like in Proverbs 14, 27, that, that passage we looked at no longer applies to those who are saved from God's wrath in hell. In fact, the perfect love of God is expressed on the cross by Jesus Christ, and that has cast out all fear for believers that we had at one time toward God. Thank you. Think about that. Because of Jesus on the cross, the fear that we once had of God, rightfully so, is no longer there. We don't have the kind of fear that we're talking about because fear has to do with, what did he say? Punishment. Eternal punishment, which means God's wrath in hell and then the lake of fire. I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. And that's the eternal damnation of the lost. And that is found in Revelation chapter 20, verses 14 and 15. So eternal punishment is what facilitates the fear of God. And according to John, here in 1 John, who was inspired by the Spirit, what Jesus accomplished on the cross for all who believe ends their fear of God as we understand his eternal wrath in hell. Instead, God bestows something precious and gracious to his own. And this is found, you don't have to turn there. You've already got this verse memorized. And this is found in Hebrews 4.16, where we are told, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, the perfect love that cast out all fear for believers was unfathomable to the Jews of that day, but is true for us. Now, if you'll remember, and I know you know this, that in Judaism, the high priest was only allowed into the Holy of Holies one time a year. And after he went through an extensive time of ritual cleansing, because if he didn't do everything just right the way the Lord said, and he went into the Holy of Holies, he would be struck dead. But that's not the way it is for us. The scripture tells us that we have been granted access to God's throne any time, anywhere, for as short or as long as, as he calls us, and we might think as we desire, and it's all because of the blood of Christ that has cleansed us from all sin. The high priest was fearfully careful to approach God according to the law. But we are able to go before the throne of God boldly. Not because of anything we've done, or who we are, but because of Jesus' death and resurrection. Boldly does not mean we can make arrogant demands to God when we pray. It just means that we are able to go to God in prayer ourselves, and that in and of itself is just flat out bold to those of previous years. One little quick thought about what this may be. Um, the son of the president of the United States can go see him anytime he wants to. But that's still his dad. And he still needs to show respect to him. It's the same for us. God is our father. And we can go to him anytime. But we need to remember who God is. He is high and lifted up. Now, I think, I know that's a lot. I know it's very quick. I know that... Uh, you may not have had time to turn to the passages. I hope you wrote them down, or maybe you can watch again later. But I hope that that gives us a little bit better handle on what it means for believers 
that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. I know I feel better. I don't know about y'all, but I feel better. But there's one more thing that I want, I want us to look at before we leave. Because when I got through to this point writing, I, I asked myself this question. What does all that I just wrote and I've just read and I've just looked at, what does it look like for me, for you, for us? Is there a way for believers to grow in having no fear that John wrote about in 1 John 4, 18 through 18 and 19? The answer is yes. And you should be back in Psalm 1, 12 now. And, and just verse 1, because that one verse uh, has really three, three sections to it. And I know I haven't pointed it out, but we've done section 1 and 2. And now we're going to look at section 3. Because those who fear the Lord, there is something that is evident about them. Greatly, they delight in His commandments. You know what that means? They love this. They love the Bible. They love God's Word. They love the Gospel. Whether it's in a Sunday school lesson or a hymn or a song or a discussion or reading or devotional or whether it's a study. A, a believer in Christ who has the uh, who, who has the love of God and praises God is going to greatly, it says, delight in His commandments. Now, How do we keep from wasting away and dying physically? Is there something that we do sometimes three times a day and maybe a little snack in between? We eat. Eat is the food for the body. If you do not eat, and not only just eat, but eat properly and rightly, it can have significant consequences. In fact, if you don't eat for long enough, you die. If you don't eat for a period of time, you get weak. Brothers and sisters, it is the... Did you know God has given our body hunger in order for us to desire Him? Jesus said, I am, I am the bread of life. And so we have that hunger. And next time you feel hungry, you know what we ought to think about? It's Jesus. The Word of God, our salvation, He gave it there to draw us to Him. In fact, He said, and if we, you know, it's a, my point is, is the way these things happen with our body, the same thing happens with our soul. If we don't feed our soul with good food, good bread, on a regular basis, how many times a day do y'all eat? Well, I ain't going to tell you how many times a day I eat something. But that's really a good way to think about it. How often should we feast on the word, the bread of life, the, the Bible, the scripture of God? It's on a regular basis, maybe several times a day. I mean, if we only ate one time a week or maybe five times a week, we'd be, we'd be alive, but we wouldn't be very healthy. So, so the connection here I'm wanting us to see is that, is that they greatly, what, what is it he said? Um, He talked about how those who fear the Lord will greatly delight in his commandments. In other words, we'll be drawn to that from our soul. In Matthew 5, 6, Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Our spirit is not satisfied without the input of the word of God. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. I'm going to explain that here in just a second. Jesus said in 6.35 of John, He said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. You know what the evidence of spiritual hunger is? In other words, not eating as we should or going to the table of God, here's what will result in a person's life. 
There will be worry. There will be anger. There will be fear. And then I can just read Galatians 5.19 to you. That doesn't mean that all of these happen, but they, they can all come and go. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery. And by the way, the word sorcery there uh, is the Greek word pharmakia, from which we get the word pharmacy, which means drug use. Could be alcohol, mar marijuana, could be any of the, the drugs that are misused. But it talks about sorcery, pharmakia, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But what is spiritual health? It's love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the things that result when a person has had the fear of God. In the beginning of wisdom, God builds those into their life over time. Those who have not gone through the order of salvation so as to be saved, they're still up there in the previous paragraph of worry, anger, fear, frustration, all those things. And here's, here's the way I'd like for us to, to end today's message. Is to ask ourselves by prayer through the Holy Spirit. Which of these, spiritual hunger or spiritual health, are most prevalent in our life? Hunger or health? Fear or faith? There may even be someone who understands, and maybe by today, or maybe this culminates in the time when they have had a fear of what will happen after I draw my last breath. What will happen? And if it causes fear, well, the fear is eternal damnation and perfect love, the love of God through Jesus Christ on the cross cast out all fear. So I pray that we will not fear God, but that we will continually go before his throne of grace to find help in time of need. Let's pray. Lord, we, we have all in some degree experienced fear of you, fear of eternal damnation, fear that we have sinned that we cannot get rid of. But you call us to your side so that through the death and resurrection of your son, all fear is cast out because the fear of punishment is then gone because of him. God, I do pray that any or those who might be listening take time to meditate and contemplate on these deep truths, not from what I've said, but in the scripture and your spirit. So that if salvation is needed, that you would bring it to them through the order that we even talked about today. And as always, we give this time to you. And we love you because you first loved us. In Christ's name, amen. Let's all stand. <coughs>